Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this evening. Thank you for this time, Lord, just to get together as your family, your children, to worship you and to fellowship and to sit under the teaching of your word. Lord, we just ask that you would speak now, Lord, as we open a new book tonight. And Lord, just give us direction as we make our way into it. Lord, I I pray that we would be keen to see what it is you have for us in this book and that we would be able to make application for our lives. And Lord, I just pray there'd be an excitement, Lord, for another amazing story of your power going forth and the way that you take care of your people. So Lord, we just turn this time over to you. We ask that your spirit would move in our midst and that you would be blessed. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So you can open with me to Joshua, sixth book from the beginning of your Bible, unless you have some Bible I don't know about. And as I said on Sunday, as we finished Deuteronomy, that we would just move on in Wednesday nights to continue the story. I love the book of Joshua. It's a great story. If you like war stories, it's a good war story. If you like seeing God win and our enemies lose, it's a good story. But it starts a little bit slow. I'll admit that. It kind of warms up into some of the greater parts of the book. Let's take a look at just some of the facts. You know, it kind of serves as a bridge. We had that five books of what we call the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch in Hebrew, um, that begins the Old Testament, all written by the hand of Moses, and maybe in the case of Deuteronomy, finished by somebody else's hand, but we don't know. And then we have this now this bridge between those five books and what starts as the history books, And the history books in the Old Testament are Joshua through the book of Esther. But if you were to talk to the Jews about how they see these books now following Deuteronomy, they would call these books the former prophets. That's their title for these books. And that would go from Joshua through Ezra, Nehemiah time frame. But we don't have to get hung up on that. It's just, no matter how you look at them, they are definitely historical books. They kind of give the history of Israel coming into the land and the different things that follow. Um, The authorship of this book, we assume to be Joshua. There's a lot of um, scholarly evidence to the fact that it was written by Joshua. There's places in the book where he speaks first person. It sort of helps us see it as Joshua's hand. I think about the fact that he spent all of those years with Moses, who was busy penning, the books that he wrote, and I think it would have been probably a habit that would have been handed down from Moses to his protege, Joshua. Um, But the fact is, like Moses, sometime towards the end of this book, Joshua dies. And then we see the book get finished. So there was always a question is, how does he write, you know, um, after his own death? Well, there's a great chance that the high priest, Eleazar, would have finished began to finish the story that was being written but then he dies and so the thought by scholars is then it's finished by joshua's son whose name was phineas so as far as time frame again a little bit of a guess but there's some evidence that would help us put it around the mid 1400s bc there's a good chance it probably falls someplace between 1350 bc and 1400 bc long time ago Um, and then the theme of the book and really the best way I could wrap it up is you know as Exodus is the story of God leading his people out of the land of Egypt this here Joshua is the book of God leading his people into the promised land and so that's really the, the entire theme and the battles that take place to make that possible and in that theme and in the book, this book as it unfolds, really we see the promise that was made to Abraham in Genesis being fulfilled. And that promise was made in chapter 15 of Genesis, beginning, beginning in verse 13. It says, then he said to Abraham, speaking of the Lord, speaking to Abram, and actually his name wasn't even Abraham yet, it was Abram before it was changed. 
But the Lord says, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. That's speaking of their time in, in Egypt. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge, which he did. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions, which they did. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, speaking of the land. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So we can, we can surmise some things, but a lot of it's conjecture as to why that exact time frame took place. Why was it 430 years of captivity in Egypt? And then why was it all, you know, all these different lengths of time that it took for this day to finally arrive? Well, it was all in God's timing. That's what we know for sure. But the promise comes about as God's promises always do. So we come out of that book of Deuteronomy like we did on Sunday. We have the people, if we want to picture it, that are encamped on the east side of the Jordan. And that's where they've been resting, waiting for what now will unfold. Moses has died. We, we know that. And Joshua has become the commander-in-chief. And he's about to lead this great nation of people, which we're guessing at about two million people. Two million people across this river. And it's not a great river. If you've ever been to Israel, you know it's not a great river. Um, it's, it's kind of a minor river when it comes to rivers. Um, but it's a river nonetheless. The water moves nonetheless. And, you know, you try to get one person or two people across the river, it's a big deal. And God certainly knew that that was going to be a big deal. And we'll get to see exactly how God assists them in getting across that river. But he's got to move these people, all their stuff, all their animals. You know, all the U-Hauls are hooked up. And, they're, you know, they're going to have to make this journey across Verse 1 of our first chapter says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. And we talked about it on Sunday, but one of the great things that we, we, we've learned already about Joshua is that he's very comfortable. He's been very comfortable in the presence of the Lord. Did it begin like that? I don't know. I mean, I don't know what it was like for Joshua the first time that he was in the tent of meeting with Moses, and God comes, shows up to speak to Moses. Pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, everything else that goes with that, which I can only imagine. But Joshua has become a man that's comfortable once in service, because he served Moses. He served Moses, and therefore he served the Lord, and he served all those people. And one who's just comfortable in the presence of the Lord, which I said on Sunday isn't really the testimony of every person. It's not the testimony of every believer, that they're comfortable in the presence of the Lord. Because he's a consuming fire, and he's God Almighty, and that's a lot to deal with. So here's Joshua being spoken to now directly as the new leader by God himself. And it's interesting because there's a deeper picture here and I'm going to probably say that a few times throughout this book because there's so many deep pictures of things to come in the book of Joshua. And it's interesting because there's so many things that are types. And they, we use that word a lot in Old Testament studies. Types of, of the Lord. You know, things that, that are being shown through other people, through other situations, but they're types of our Savior. It, 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 it gives a future picture of our Savior. And it's interesting because the last time I taught this book, I had somebody that was kind of not, well, he was kind of in our congregation and he had been a pastor for 20 some years and was kind of semi-retired. And he kind of scolded me, and not me, but every teacher that takes this book and really spends too much time showing those future pictures and the association of Joshua and Jesus, not being equals, but a picture of Jesus in Joshua. And I, I, I thought maybe I'd done something wrong, but I've, I've come a long way from then. And I, I, don't, I don't think you can ignore it. And, and so I'm not going to ignore it. Um, but it's a, one of the deeper pictures, just as we get into this, is remember that Moses is a representation of the law. We talked about that on Sunday, just in the Mount of Transfiguration, when 
when Moses and Elijah are there. And Elijah is a representation of the prophets, and Moses is a representation of the law. And at that time, on that, you know, the process was unfolding that Jesus was the one they were to follow. They were to follow the word who was made flesh. And so as much as they wanted the men that were there that night, wanted to look upon the law, look upon the prophets, God said, no, this is my son, hear him. And so if you look at them entering into the land with an extended view of people entering into the presence of the Lord on the other side of the cross, entering into salvation that Jesus would die and be raised again to bring us, then in a sense, the law could not lead them into the land. Can you see that as a picture? The law couldn't lead them into the land. The law couldn't lead us into salvation. What had to be done is that, that something different than the law had to lead them. And that's where we see one of the types in Joshua. Because isn't it interesting that if you and I had been present living when Jesus lived, and someone just along the way had introduced us to Jesus, they wouldn't have said, hey, you know what, here's Jesus Christ. You know, they wouldn't even have said, here's Jesus. And they certainly wouldn't have said, here's Mr. Christ. They'd have said in English, I'd like you to meet Joshua. And in Hebrew, they would have said, I would like you to meet Yahshua. Or Yahshua. There's different ways of saying it. Matter of fact, there's like five different ways of saying it. But here he has the name in common, this Joshua, with our Savior. He has the same Hebrew name, and the name means the same thing. It means salvation. So in that picture of, of Joshua, not being our Lord, not being our Savior, but as a picture, a type of, we see that the law would not lead them in. The law would not lead us into the promised land. But the Savior would. Salvation would lead us in. And so... A lot of that's going to be played out as we go into this book. Joshua wasn't a young man at this time. Joshua could have been in his early 90s. Okay? So, you know, I heard that reaction. <laughs> you know, it's different for us. We're like, wow, you know. But, but for them, it wasn't such a big deal. You know, I mean, Joshua was in the gym like every day. And, but he had to be tough. He had to be tough because we know all the way back 40 years ago, he stood with Caleb amongst 12 spies and said, no, let's go. Let's go. We want to fight. We can take them. And they had that great sin at Kadesh Barnea because the rest said, no, we're like grasshoppers in their eyes. But Joshua was prepared by faithful service to Moses and to the Lord. And he was prepared in small things by being Moses' assistant. You know, I thought about that, and we see that a lot in the Bible, and even we see it in Scripture teaching us that. Jesus said in Luke 16, 10, he was faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And it's hard for sometimes for us, even in the body of Christ, going through this Christian life, understanding how important it is to be faithful to the small things that we're given so that the Lord would reward us with the big things. And I don't mean big things like, you know, a nice fancy house and a car. You know, I'm talking about just bigger responsibilities, bigger opportunities to serve. But we start with small things. And I think about how challenged the church is in that spiritual application because of how foreign that thought is in these days in the modern culture. Because young people now have no concept, for the most part, about working their way into anything. There's this assumption that, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move, you know, I'm going to now get a job and I'm going to be CEO in about 13 days. Because I don't have to work to get there, I should just get it. And I'm not saying every young person is like that, but that's something that permeates this culture that I don't remember when I was that age, and I don't most of you don't either. It's been a change. And... Um, even spiritually, we start with small things. We show our faithfulness in small things. Um, verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Is God still speaking? Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. 
Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said, to Moses. So he begins to spell out this commission that he now has, that Joshua now has as the leader. And notice twice there in those two verses, it says, I am giving. The Lord says, I am giving. And then in verse 3, I have given you. And yet it says that the sole of your foot will tread upon. So we see two pictures taking place. One that's being done and one that needs to be done. The one that's being done is that God gives. God's giving them the land. But they have the obligation to walk upon it. To tread upon it. You know, we were told all the way back in Genesis, just as people, that we were to take dominion over the earth. We were to subdue the earth. And now they're being told, in a sense, the same thing. I'm going to give you this land, but it's up to you to be faithful to that calling. And he's going to go many times in just this first chapter and tell them what it's going to take. And it's going to take courage. It's going to take courage for them to be able to do what he's calling them to do. Verse 4, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave nor forsake you. So one of the things we see is that this is, this is the definition of real estate. Real estate. This is real land with real boundaries that's been given to a real people. I emphasize that because we know if you follow the news and history of the last 20, 30 years, that's really an argument with the people of Israel. It's really an argument with the Jewish people of whether they have a right to the land that they're in. I always get kind of a morbid joy out of when a politician says about Israel, well, let's take them back to their pre-67 borders. I'm like, yeah, there it is. Because there's a lot of countries that would lose land if it went back to exactly what Abraham was promised. They think going back to 67 borders would free up the occupied territories. And that's not at all what God was speaking about. But for the first of two specific times, verse 5, God's telling him, I'm, I'm with you. I was with Moses, even in his disobedience, even in every time that people were stubborn and stiff-necked. I was with them. And like I was with him, I'll be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. We quote that a lot. There's people that quote that have no idea where they get that. They'd probably tell you it was in the New Testament. And then it goes on with this encouragement, verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, right or left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success." Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now verse 9 is the one that's usually quoted. It's the one that's usually seen on a little plaque or something. And he's telling them all the way through, once again, be strong and of good courage. Be strong and very courageous. And as I said on Sunday, he's being told this because he's capable of not being such just like all of us. We need that encouragement of the Lord to be strong, to be courageous, because every one of us has the capability and our flesh would love to go in the direction of being weak, of not being brave. And we all need that encouragement. Joshua needed that encouragement. And when did he give it to him? Not later after he failed or was in the middle of battle. He gave it to him up front. And God gives us that, if, especially if we're well-versed with the word, we, we know the encouragement's already been given. You know, sometimes we wait until we're crushed, and then we run to the word to see what the Lord might say to us. It's so, it would be so much better to know already what the Lord would say to us so that when we run into the battle, we're already armored 
with what God's promises are for us, his covering is for us. Notice in verse 8, three very specific things about the book of the law, the scripture that they had had so far. One shall not depart from your mouth. And I think we should take each of these to heart today. The word of God shall not depart from mouth. That doesn't mean we wouldn't speak it, but that it would always be in our mouth ready to be spoken. That we would never be without the word of God. And when I say that, it doesn't mean you need to memorize the New Testament. Although if you can, fine, that'd be cool. There have been many men in the past, famous men, that have, that have memorized full books of the Bible. I've thought about attempting that before and I'll keep thinking about it. Um, but we should have the word ready in our mouth, not having to go look for it, as I said a moment ago. And then once we have the word, what do we do with it? We meditate it, meditate in it day and night. In other words, it's not something that we look for at the end of the week. It's not something we wait for Wednesday night or Sunday morning. It's something that each day, to some level, we are meditating. We're considering the word of God. And it's pretty cool. You only got to do it twice a day, all day, all night. But then once we have it not far from our mouth and we have it in us that we would consider it day and night, then the third thing is we observe to do. Not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. That we would be doing what the Lord has spoken to us. And how do we maintain those three things in our lives? Then we take this word in these verses for ourselves. That we're to be strong and of good courage. Be strong and very courageous. Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. And why? And how? For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go wherever you go. You know, in the New Testament, almost every, and I would say every, but I don't want to, I could be proven wrong. So I'll say almost every. Almost every time you see in the New Testament the encouragement to walk, walk in the Spirit. You know, there's so many places where there's study on walking. And you go to the definition of the Greek word, it's kind of an interesting definition. It says, and I see it every time I think about it or say it, it says walk all about. Wherever you go, it's not just, you know, walking in your little box or your little circle or the, it's walk every, you know, walking everywhere. We're, we're, to be, we're to be in motion. And I think that's such an important part of our faith. Remember, in almost every case, the word faith is a verb. It's a verb. It's something we do. It's something we live out. Verse 10, then Joshua commanded the officers of the people saying, Pass through the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves, for within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. So an order goes out throughout the camp to break camp. Now you can imagine, I mean, that's not something you're going to do in a moment. He gives them three days to break camp to get ready to move across. So in a sense, they're given three days to wait. But days of waiting are always days of preparation when it comes to God's work. And I think that's a really important thing to do because in my experience, and I'm pretty sure I'm right, there's only three answers to prayer. It's yes, it's no, or it's wait. In my personal experience, wait seems to be the big one. But wait doesn't mean sit still. And I always put a caveat there. There are times we are to sit still before the Lord and wait to hear from Him. But most times we're being told to stay busy, not just to stay busy, but because there's preparations to be made. Are you ready for the answer to the prayer to actually come? Once you've gone through the waiting period, are you ready to be told no? Have you prepared for being told no? Have you been prepared to hear yes? Because each of those answers has consequence and will require action and will require faith. So in the days of waiting, there's always days of preparation. And the fact is, there's no wasted time with God. You know, God is infinite, but we're not. Sometimes we forget that we act like we are, but we're not infinite. We've been given a finite amount of time in this life. And it's been numbered by God, and it's certain. 
So he doesn't waste time. He has something for us to do, I think, all the time. And I know it's hard sometimes to discern that. Hey, what am I supposed to be doing now? And how many of the things am I doing now that I probably shouldn't be doing because I'm supposed to be doing whatever? I, none of you have probably ever had that discussion with yourself. Verse 12. And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua spoke, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is giving you rest and is giving you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan, but you shall pass before your brethren armed, all your mighty men of valor, and help them. Until the Lord has given, you, given your brethren rest as he gave you, and they also have taken possession of the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possessions and enjoy it, which Moses' Lord's servant gave you on this side of the Jordan toward the sunrise. You may recall, and if not, let me remind you, these particular tribes found it satisfactory to stay on the east side of the Jordan. They wanted to be there with their livestock. They liked the setting. You know, it's all about location, location, location. They were good. The Lord said, I'll grant you that through Moses. He told him, I'll grant you that. However, when your brethren go into the land, your wives and your children, your livestock may remain in the land that I'm that you have asked for, but you will go with your brethren, you will fight on the other side of the Jordan. And when that fight is done, you can return to your homes. So Joshua is reminding of that, and in verse 16 they respond. So they answered Joshua saying, all that you command us we will do, and whatever you send us, wherever you send us we will go. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words and all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. So they promised their allegiance to Joshua's command. Really a, a beautiful picture. They're confirming, they're confirming his leadership to the point where they say, whoever doesn't obey you, we will kill. And then isn't it interesting at the end there, verse 18, listen to what they say to their leader. Only be strong and of good courage. And so whether they heard that from the Lord being spoken to Joshua, which I doubt, we probably see a picture of just the beauty of God giving confirmation through his troops of the same message, that they need him as their leader to be courageous, to be strong. And it's always good, I mean, when you can give anyone in a leadership role that encouragement, a reminder that they need to be like that because it's easy to fall out of that. Let's go into chapter two. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab. So Joshua sends out two spies. And if you know the story of what happened 40 years ago, you might go, oh my gosh, again? But it was different, and it was definitely being done by the hand of a man who knew the consequences, because he was one of the 12 spies. And so he only sends two, which if you think about it, by scriptural instruction is the minimum number to have a witness, by the witness of two or three. So he doesn't even give him a third person. We don't even need that. Just get two people out there. One can verify what the other says or sees. And that's all we need. And he tells them to spy secretly. So in my opinion, that meant, I'm sending you guys, we don't even need to tell everybody. Just go do this and bring back your report. Because as soon as it gets out to the people, then it's going to become something more than it needs to be. And he tells them, go view the land, especially Jericho. Why Jericho? Well, even if you go there today, you'll find, if you journeyed from, you'd have to be in the right area, but if you journey from the area they crossed the Jordan and you move westward, you were gonna, the first city you're going to come to is Jericho, which currently is in ruin, which, by the way, is exactly what God promised to, Jer to Jericho would happen to them. Not only in the fact that they dropped those walls, which we'll get to that story, but he told them you'll be left in ruin in that area right now. Um, the, the, re, the remains that's never been rebuilt, it is in ruin. And that whole area is all Arab. 
it's not even really occupied by Jewish people at all, just Israeli Arabs. <clears throat> and then they come and they went into the house of a harlot named Rahab. You know, all kinds of teachings are done about this situation. And we're supposed to come into it by all the teachings I've read of old, we're supposed to come into it with some kind of shock and horror that they actually went to a harlot's home. And I get why, because that seems kind of strange for men of God to go into a harlot's home. But you know what I really thought about this today? Is maybe 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, it would have seemed a lot more shocking. And I thought about where we're at. And how less shocking things are. You know? And I don't, it's a shame that sometimes we're less shocked by things. Um, so I'm not trying to get you to be shocked. I'm just trying to remind us that sometimes there's things that offend God that we're so used to now in our culture that we're like, we just, it just passes by. We're, we're insensitive to it. But they come to the, this harlot named Rahab and they go into her house. And as far as strategics strategic thinking goes pretty smart because that's probably some place they're not going to be looked for and they would kind of blend in with all the men going in and out of such a place but we're going to find out some things about Rahab because there's a bigger plan at work as there always is and I think it's a great reminder to be said even going into this story is that there's always a greater story there's always something bigger going on we look at our situation and maybe we even lift our eyes a little to look at those around us immediately. But sometimes we don't have, I'd say many times, we don't have a clue what God's actually doing and what he's working out. And when we guess that we do, very often we're wrong. So verse 2, And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So... The spies were being spied upon. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they are from. And it happened as the gate was being shut when it was dark that the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you may overtake them. But she brought them up to the roof, hidden them with the stalks of flax which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them by the road to Jordan to the fords. And as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. So the second shock we're supposed to have is that she lied. But that's that shock that sometimes we have that a person not saved wouldn't act like someone who's saved. So it's not really so much that she lied, which would tell us, oh my gosh, she's a sinner. So are we. Saved by grace, and so shall she be. Verse 8. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord, I, just listen to her heart. I know the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. That's a confession of faith. Now therefore I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. So the men answered her, Our lives for yours, if none of you tell this business of ours, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. So we see here Rahab's profession as a proof of her faith. And it may not have been a strong faith, it may not have been a perfect faith, but her faith was praiseworthy nonetheless. 
You know, she's spoken about in Hebrews chapter 11 in what they call the hall of faith. All the great saints that are listed there in Hebrews chapter 11, Rahab appears there. And there it says, by faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she received the spies with peace. And then in James chapter 2, it says, Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Now, some could be appalled at the fact that Rahab was a prostitute or that she was a liar. But the fact is she wasn't saved by the work of lying. She was saved by her faith. It's not like God's overlooking the fact she was a liar. It's not like we're supposed to see lying as a good thing and somehow fit it into our, our, our narrative of our lives and saying, well, I can lie and God won't mind. That's not the message here. What we need to see is her faith. She knew who God was, she knew who she was, and she trusted God for her very life. Rahab spoke her desire to see her family saved and went to great length in order to save their lives And this demonstrated the love that she had, and that should be noticed as well as her faith. And she asked the spy, swear to me by the Lord. This showed that Rahab longed for assurance, asking for an oath. She wanted to leave her sinful life and culture and come with God's people. Let's pick up with verse 15. Then she let them down by a rope through a window, for her house was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall. Some of the places that people live were literally on the wall of the city so outside the window was sort of outside the city outside the walls of the city so she let them down by a rope verse 16 and she said to them get to the mountains lest the pursuers meet you hide there three days until the pursuers have returned afterward you may go your way so the men said to her we will be blameless of this oath of yours which you have made us swear unless when we come into the land you bind this line of scarlet cord in your window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household to your own home, so it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell the business of ours, then we will be free from your oath which you have made us swear. Then she said, according to your words, so be it. And then she sent them away and they departed and she bound the scarlet cord in the window. And so they make this pact and basically says, we'll save you and your household if, first of all, you bring all of your your family to your own home. We'll protect this house and all that are in it. And if they go out into the streets, the blood's on their own head because they're going to end up killed with the rest that we kill. But if they're in your house and one of us comes in and comes against them, then it's on our head. But here's the deal. You need to tie this ribbon of scarlet on your window to mark it. Because you can just imagine looking up at that wall to remember which window, which house it is. But you know, you take that part of the story and you go back to the night before the exodus in Egypt. And you remember the instruction that was given on that first Passover, that they would kill that lamb, and that the man of the house would take the blood of that perfect sacrifice, and he would put the blood on the lintel of the door. So when the angel of death passed over, they would see the blood of the sacrifice, and that blood would be the covering upon that household, and they would be spared of the death that night. And we see now a scarlet ribbon. And we see that foreshadowing, or actually the looking back to that, and the foreshadowing again of the cross and the blood that would be shed by Jesus, the covering. And you know what's interesting about Rahab is, you know, her destiny was to marry one of the princes of Judah and be found in the lineage of King, uh, yeah, lineage of King David and, and Jesus himself. I mean, if you go back to the genealogy of Jesus, our Savior. Not only is she listed in the Hall of Faith, Hebrews chapter 11, she's in the lineage of Jesus himself. And if this isn't a picture of God's mercy and grace for the ones that he loves and wishes 
to have in his kingdom. I, I, I don't know what is. Verse 22, they departed and went to the mountains and stayed there three days until the pursuers returned. The pursuers sought them all along the way but did not find them. So the two men returned, descended from the mountain, and crossed over, and they came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and told him all that had befallen them. And they said to Joshua, truly the Lord has delivered all the land into our hands, for indeed all the inhabitants of the country are faint-hearted because of us. So the spies' mission and the subsequent report that they brought back, it didn't help with military strategy. It's not like they went in and mapped out the land in their course of attack. But what they brought back was help in encouraging the faith of the spies themselves and the whole nation. And how different is that than what happened 40 years before at Kadesh Barnea? That was was a complete and utter disaster what took place previously. But this was an encouragement And you know, there was another purpose for sending the spies in. Can you guess it? To save Rahab. I mean, think about that. All the way from the garden, Satan has chased the royal bloodline. He's chased it and he has sought to stop it and destroy it so our Savior would never come. And here was a woman destined before the foundations of the earth to be in the bloodline of our Savior. And if this had not happened, which it was ordained to happen, think about that. How wonderful God's plans is the detail that he will pursue in a single life to bring about his purposes. To which I would say not one of us on any given day, can truly proclaim that we understand completely what the Lord's doing with our lives. Because Rahab had no clue how important she was. And I think that's just a perspective we have to keep and just find such great hope in that. And yet the mystery is so great as to what's going on around us. You just see that extent that God went to bring one woman in her father's house to salvation. And this was a person that we would, would have judged if told the story in a different way. It would have been impossible to save. We don't know who's impossible to save. I don't think we're ever supposed to consider anyone impossible to save. We're going to move through chapter 3 because I'm pretty much just going to read it. And then we'll close. It says, And Joshua rose early in the morning, And they set out from Acacia Grove and came to Jordan. He and all the children of Israel lodged there before they crossed over. So it was after three days, the officers went through the camp and they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it that you may know the way by which you must go. For you have not passed this way before. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. I said we were just going to read it, but I wasn't honest. Um, First of all, they're receiving their marching orders. They're receiving their marching orders. And he's saying they're going to bring the Ark of the Covenant, which is the representation of God in their midst. He's going to bring, when you see the Ark of the Covenant come by, God's presence come by, you prepare And then you follow, but you are to have this distance between you and the ark. And remember, bad things befell those that touched the ark. This seems like an extreme amount of distance. And I don't want to assume too many things, but one of the things I think this great distance does, and you're talking about about 3,000 feet of distance, okay, 1,000 yards of distance, But what I really believe that brings is perspective. To stand back and watch the Lord move. You know, because sometimes we want to be so close, and we're to be close to the Lord, don't get me wrong, but sometimes we want to push so close that we can't see the circumstances. We can't see what's going on. It's so important, especially as busy as we are, to back up. You know, when I was... When I was in the Navy, what I, what I did in the Navy was very led, or it, 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 was, it lent itself to a very chaotic 
environment. And we would be very busy to the point where 12 hours could go by like 15 minutes. And you, what, I, I was known for doing a particular thing, and this isn't a bragging point because a lot of people hated it, but I was known for doing a very particular thing. And in the midst sometimes of the busiest moment of operations, when the last thing you ever would think of doing was stopping, I would stop all work. And I would bring everybody up. We had a huge briefing map of the world and all of our operations. And I would bring everybody up to the briefing plot. And I would tell everybody to take a breath and that I would brief them exactly where we're at, exactly what's going on, and how everything we're doing connects to all the other assets out there that we don't see. And then I'd send them back to work. It was a matter of regaining perspective. Because we were so nose into the picture, we had no idea what the picture was. And throughout those 12 hours or 15 hours or 20 hours, the picture would get narrow and narrow and to the point we didn't know why we were doing what we were doing. And sometimes I just think we need perspective on what God's doing. We need to be willing to stand back as he moves so that we can understand better what direction he's going. Because sometimes I think we can just be like that pesty little child that's like right up behind him, you know, saying things like, why, why, why? And I think he just wants us sometimes to stand back a little bit and maybe then we'll understand why. Because we can see what he's doing. So he tells them to sanctify themselves and basically just separate yourselves from your worldly stuff and understand that you're about to see some wonders. Verse 6, then Joshua spoke to the priest saying, take up the ark of the covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the ark of the covenant and went before the people. We see an act of obedience and faith because they're being obedient to what the Lord said, what Joshua has relayed, and they're having faith that this, for some reason, somehow makes sense. Verse 7, And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. So God's establishing Joshua's leadership in the eyes of his people. Joshua needs to remain obedient to the finest of God's instructions. He could have said, you know what, just grab the ark and go stand by the river. God didn't say stand by the river. God said have those stand in the river. And it was the priests that were carrying it. Stand in the river. Verse 9, so Joshua said to the children of Israel, come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, by this you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out from you, before you, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. These were all those tribes of giants that had scared the spies 40 years before. Verse 11, behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take for yourselves 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from every tribe. We'll figure out next chapter what that's all about. And it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that come down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. And so he's saying in their obedience, in their faithfulness to come to the banks of the river and step into the banks of the river. Now, one of the things we need to understand is that the Jordan has a floodplain. In certain times of year, it overcomes its banks. And this would have been that time of year. So even before they were to the actual edge of the river, they were in the waters of the Jordan. And so also we know how the water runs. Those of us that live here, we know the waters run when it's that time of year and the The waters are high. And so they're being faithful to step in. And he says there in verse 13 that that the ark shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, a promise, and they shall stand up as a heap. What a picture. 
Verse 14, so it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan and the feet of the priests who bore the Ark dipped into the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zaratan, so that the waters that went down into the sea of the Arabah, the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Then the priest who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on the ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all of Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed over completely over the Jordan. So they come with the Ark of the Covenant, the priests. They step in so that their feet are in the water. And then what God promised begins to happen. That upriver somewhere at a city called Adam, the waters heap up and stop. Now, the mileage between where they cross the Jordan and where, and it tells us where, they're right across from Jericho, and where the water heaped up at Adam was about 11 miles. Now, I think this is one of, one of those intense pictures that we could just run past without understanding the application for all of us. Because how often does God ask us to do something? How often does he ask us to do something and in that situation he also tells us to wait? How many times have we seen in scripture that someone was told to wait and they didn't? Think of Abraham and his wife that weren't willing to wait for the promised son. And his wife prematurely says, well, let's just do it our way, and here's my handmaiden. Go into her and have a child. And from that interlude came Ishmael. Now, Israel still contends with the offspring of Ishmael every day. The consequence of that sin still exists to this day. And see, when we're not willing to wait to see the promise of God actually come to fruition, we end up with Ishmael's running around everywhere. And they follow us through time. So they were standing in the water being told somehow that something miraculous was going to happen while the waters were heaping up 11 miles up. Now, depending upon the volume of the river and the speed and stuff, you can do some math and figure out how long that took. I've never done that because I don't know those numbers. But the fact is, they had to have faith that somewhere apart from their physical sight, God was at work. That's the hard thing about our faith. The hard thing about our faith is believing that somewhere that we can't see, God's at work. And that he's doing something that's going to provide us a path that's clear enough to go do what he's asked us to do. And that's what, he was, that's what he was providing for them. They had to wait for 11 miles of water to pass by to witness the promise, to be able to access what they were being promised to enter into. And I think the application doesn't need much more illustration from me. I think every one of us can see what that's saying. Because I said a moment ago that we're going to get three answers to prayer. By the way, first you've got to pray. Yes, no, or maybe. If it's yes, at least you know, and it may not be the answer you wanted. If it's no, at least you know, and it may not be the answer you wanted. Of course, either of those could be the very answer you wanted. But that one about wait is a mystery. And how do I, how do I wait when I can't see? And that also goes to that great picture that we're given in the New Testament of Jesus being our hope. And it says that our hope is an anchor. Now, if our hope is an anchor, that's another very interesting picture because an anchor doesn't do what it was designed to do unless it's out of sight. An anchor is doing its full duty. So when we're hoping, we're hoping in something we can't see, and yet we know it's at work, and that's our assurance, is that we know by faith that it's happening. But I'm going to tell you something else. That's why we need each other. Because when you or I or somebody we know is standing there seemingly silly up to their ankles or their knees in water and we walk by and go, what are you doing? Well, God said, 
Or, or maybe we've talked to them before and we saw them there once before, but now they're back up on dry land. And what happened? Well, nothing happened. That's why I'm back up on dry land. We need the encouragement of one another to stand still sometimes, to wait. To wait, to see him move. To know that somehow his plan is being done. Just like it was for Rahab. There's some plan for your life, for my life, that is perfect and for good. And I can stand up here and preach that tonight. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to need your encouragement by like tomorrow. And I'm just trying to be real with you because I know how tough it is to hold on to what I just said. But again, that's why we need each other. To remind one another, to pray with one another, to encourage one another. That these things are really happening even though we can't see them. That there's some reason we're here. There's some reason God saved us. And then, and then you look at all the stuff that's in our lives and you're like, why, Lord? There's a reason. There's a reason. And I know faith is a big word. It's a big word, but it's supposed to be big. It's big like grace. It's big like love. Big like mercy. They're all big words. Few letters, but big words. Big concepts. And we just need to be continuously asking the Lord for wisdom so that we can walk in those things. But we need to do it together. So, one a little long, let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the start of this book, Lord. Lord, again, I just ask that as we go through it, that we would just find application. And Lord, I'm, I'm pretty confident that you gave us a lot of that tonight. And so, Lord, let us, let us hide that in our heart, but, Lord, let us walk these things out. Let it be part of that working out our own salvation, Lord, in fear and trembling. Because there is a plan. And we may not understand it, and we may be involved in circumstances that we'd rather not be, or we're uncomfortable, or there are tribulations, or all the other adjectives I could mention, Lord, but our faith has to be that you have a plan and that you're at work, and your plans will come to fruition regardless of us. But Lord, it'd be so cool to be obedient and be able to ride those plans out to the end. And so Lord, I just ask that you'd be blessed in our attention to your word, and that you'd bless us, Lord, as we try to apply these things to our life. Lord, just ask you to get us home safely, Lord, prepare us for a new day tomorrow, and I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.